Thanks, Golan. Um, so I, I, I want to give a big thanks also to the Steiner Lecture Series and also the Frank Ratchi Foundation, which recently gave a grant to support the work that Pamela and I are doing together along with Accessible Recording. Um, and uh, so when we were in the car on the way here talking about, I, I turned to Pam and I was like, you know, Pam, there's a really good chance that at the very last minute, Golan's going to ask me to introduce you. What should I say? <laughs> and he did. So um, we had a little discussion about this and decided that there's pretty much, uh, I forget what the word we used. It was sort of like, um, not shenanigans, but uh, something like that. Shady behavior, perhaps? Shadiness? Yeah, oh yeah, there's nothing in the shady history of Pamela that I could tell you that wouldn't be even more surpassed by what you're actually going to witness and have her tell you about here today. So I'm going to keep it kind of short. There's, uh, If you want to learn more about what Pamela has done, there's quite a bit of YouTube and other kinds of videos you can watch, but she's uh, in very brief uh, a world-renowned thereminist and um, musical innovator and she's gonna bring some of her techniques here to tell you about what the instrument is and what it can do. And it's a, I think you'll find it to be a very interactive presentation and with some, some music and also some Q&A built in. Um, and then uh, the only bad news I have to deliver is that we have to wrap up pretty tightly at about 10 till the top of the hour so that we can have a um, smaller workshop with, with Pam, with some of the music students. So. Sorry to, to have to cut things a little shorter than everyone would like. Um, is there anybody else I didn't thank? Thanks, Jesse, for having for hosting it. Yes, thanks to the Studio for Creative Inquiry. And uh, yeah, oh, I guess I can give a little plug because the piece that we're working on uh, is a, a hopscotch. I'm, it previously was a hopscotch completely analog on the floor, um, but I was commissioned to make a version of that for the Toronto International Film Festival exhibition. Uh, opening in a few weeks, and we have put together a, a musical composition that uh, looks at you from above with some Kinect cameras and turns your movements on the hopscotch into sounds that come out of the theremin. So if you happen to be in Toronto in the middle of February or a little bit after, then uh, you can go to TIFF and check that out. But it's super exciting. Maybe she'll even go a little bit into the composition process because on top of being a thereminist, she's also a composer. So, Pamela. I can't talk and play at the same time, thank goodness, because <laughs> he'd be like, shut up, but <laughs> or stop playing. But, um, oh, oh my God, I broke this. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, are you're all familiar with the theremin, right? Because, like, yeah, is there anyone who's a first timer? You are. Huh? What? Tal okay, so, like, the theremin is renowned for not really being able to do anything. It just stands there. But you could do a lot with it. Because <laughs> a lot of times people say, oh, I love this quote um, that, that I once read, where it's like, um, instruments don't make music, but people do. And, the, um, and so it's a good thing to kind of remember when you're dealing with this beast, you're kind of taming nature as best as you can. And the natural forces of your body's movements will have an effect on it. And, uh, and so you can get really control freaky, frustrated, because you have nothing to grab onto. So it's kind of like you're blind reaching in the dark. And you can only rely on your ears um, and respond to that with tiny, tiny movements or big gestures. And you hear the difference. And then you try to um, build your own vocabulary of movements. Um, that you start to memorize so that you're able to suddenly say words and sentences with it. But it's like, you know, in the musical language or sound language. But you can also make it sound like a bird, too, or fart. <laughs> um, let's see. Here, catch. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you what my left antenna is controlling. So 
based on just watching what I was doing, I'm sure you figured out I'm controlling the pitch by the proximity of not just my hand, but it's also responding to my whole body when I'm moving towards and away from this antenna. And what I'm doing with my elbow here is preventing it from screaming out loud because if you move far from this antenna, it'll squeal really, it's the volume antenna. So it, what's strange about this instrument is you're, you're kind of controlling um, the silence in between and masking this constant noise that would always be going on if you didn't have a way to shut it up. And this like shut up antenna is the way to kind of um, give the illusion that the thing can be separated into separate words and syllables and, and create something that sounds like a voice singing or a bass or otherworldly because of the um, infinite microtones that you have even between a very tiny space. Um, so I'll maybe start and like just do a little bit of noodling around. It's a monophonic instrument, but I'm using looping pedals so that I don't get bored with myself. <laughs>
It's like, what was that? <laughs> so I'm using a lot of um, effect-like things with this, and maybe some of you might have some questions. I know some of you probably are familiar with some of this here, because there are some familiar-looking like green pedal things here, but maybe not. So does anyone have questions? Don't be shy. I don't bite. I promise. <laughs> no questions at all? OK, yes. What are the pedals? Yes, there are two loopers in there. Um, so uh, I I use two loopers because I don't I don't want to be trapped inside just one loop because that's often what happens. But um, it's my way of being able to turn this into something that feels like a polyphonic instrument um, because uh, it gets boring, yeah, when it's just a single voice. Um, so what I'm often doing is running a loop into one looping device. And then I run it through processing um, afterwards. And um, I'm also using things like triggers so that if I'm playing a bass line, I'm able to open up the filter of the loop. So you can hear that it explodes with the bass line, and suddenly you hear some tiny harmonic pitches coming out of it. And I use a second looper sometimes to build a secondary loop that's independent of the first one. Or also, with these particular pedals, I'm able to then um, do a simulated tape delay, let's say, or mess around with uh, some of the delaying aspects of it. Um, are there other questions? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Ah, how many loops? Ah. Um, well, um, I can never handle it. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> too much is never enough. But that's a good question. Like, how many loops uh, can you maximally do? I guess it depends on how sparse the loops are or how much space you're taking. I'm limited um, time-wise with the, these certain looping devices. I know that it's possible to pull a computer on stage and have a longer-term loop. But there's also the um, a slight barrier with finding you know, the right um, the right foot control mechanism. Um, it's because if I'm not used to using a looping pedal, what's often the case is you can stomp down on the pedal, and you can hear this unintended warble, like, and that happens sometimes when you step down on a pedal. So um, 
So finding the right type of looping machine is so far is the best that I've tried out where it can have this really smooth action to step on, but it's also very practiced because I do put my weight on the other leg to keep my balance so that I, um, so that the pitches don't get too messed up when I'm tapping down on it. Um, and uh, I only have a maximum of 14 seconds time for each loop um, with this device. And I find, although that's limiting, um, what's bad is if I had a minute of time to build a loop, it would take four minutes to have four port harmony <laughs> and so on. So, so in working with the, the limitation of a short period of time to do your looping, then you can begin to do like harmonic explorations, like where c how can you get yourself out of this trap of staying in one mode? Um, so you can build uh, different types of loops based on different types of scales. And you don't have to think in sets of rules. You can really follow your ears and, uh, um, and go with what sounds interesting to you. Nothing not really so dogmatic and so strict about, oh, you need to learn notes and do ear training because it's still, um, uh, the possibilities for expression with it is as open as vocal expression um, has come to be, where someone can be like, <laughs> and like, uh, and, and that's expression. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be like operatic. Um, are there other questions? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, I'm so used to this. I see it every day, so it's kind of like, oh, same old, and I forget that it's like, oh, it's new what's going on here. <laughs> um, so this instrument, you know, a lot of people think of a synthesizer as a keyboarded instrument, but this is a synthesizer, and these were invented about 100 years ago. So it is the grandpa of the synthesizer. And the inventor, Lev Tenen, he was, uh, um, he was working for the KGB. He was Russian, a spy. And, to, and it was kind of a side project that he was working on related to his um, inventing the bug and also cleaning up um, signals for spying um, and also building devices that kind of interact in the same way, let's say there was a prisoner trapped in a room or space. And he could have an invisible um, alarm system that could let someone know at a remote distance um, if somebody is approaching or crossing this barrier that they shouldn't be going past. And just based on this concept of um, dealing with uh, an electromagnetic field capacitance. So um, I'm not good at the technical scientific side. I'm just good at describing how it's reacting to my body movements in relation to controlling this beast. But um, we think of, we take for granted things like automatic doors when you walk up to them. But when this came out 100 years ago, it was pretty mind blowing. The original instrument had just pitch control and then he added the volume control because I'm sure it just got really annoying and it's like woo, woo, the whole time. And um, the older instruments are logarithmic, just like a string instrument. And what I mean by that is when you're moving from the low notes to the high notes, it's just like if you're on a cello or a violin that the higher notes get closer together. And on this instrument, um, what's different about it, um, it's the modernized version that has more than the typical three or four octave range, and it's much more linear. So you're able to fit um, like more than eight octaves into the space between your body and this antenna. And that can make for difficulties with the spaces between your notes being very small, but you're able to adapt and change that depending on taste and what's comfortable for you. I could show you the other side of my instrument so then you could see what's going on when I'm um, making adjustments. There's a, it says wrong, wrong, because these are on the wrong side, I'm left-handed. So if you do try out a theremin, um, even if you play a stringed instrument, normally you control like the guitar, the pitch with your left hand and the rhythm with your right. Um, that's how I do it, the right-handed way. So that's totally wrong. But um, uh, you might find it easier that your fine motor control with the hand you write with might be easier in dealing with um, controlling the pitch on the instrument. Um, this is controlling 
the volume, and it has nothing to do with the amount of output coming out of the instrument, but it has to do with um, adjusting the space, like how much distance must you go to get from zero to 10, let's say. And, um, and some people prefer having a wider space. I have mine very tight and close together, so I'm making very minuscule mo movements to get to full volume. And, um, and that's the same concept, but um, on the other side for the pitch, you're able to adapt and change um, how wide or far that you want your gestures to be to jump, let's say, an octave or a full step, like da, da, da. Some people like it much wider, or usually when you're first starting out, it's easier to work in that way, and then it will get smaller and smaller as you start using more of your um, fine motor skills in dealing with it. Um, what else about this instrument? I can show you now there are range knobs, register, so I'm able to bring um, the overall instrument's voice down one the octave or down two octaves additionally to the full range because it's not so easy to play um, very close to your body for those bass notes. It then starts to go in reverse that your lower notes will get closer and closer together to nothing and then it's out of control. Um, and then you're also able to change the timbre just like on a synthesizer, the waveform and filter on the sound itself so you can adjust the sound quality. And I'll give you examples of the different sounds. And also you can then watch things like, how does she get the pizzicato and all of this? I'm not using any effects now. And I'll just um, play through examples of the different voices and ways to get around on it. I'm being recorded. So this instrument also was used um, in the 50s for a lot of those sci-fi films and horror films. We often make reference to this instrument going, ooh, and to, it's really easy to do. It's like, <coughs> or you know, it's like uh, the day the earth stood still, like, <coughs> And it's like that really annoying, and it's like, uh, the otherworldly quality about it, I think, is this constant glissando, and you can do the warbliest, weirdest vibrato with this thing. And so that was a new expressive thing for that time, especially, that you can't really pull off with another instrument, because this, you don't have to take air in. You can really keep going with it. And, to, and I think the nature of controlling it in the air and the difficulty of that is kind of how people stumbled across, like, wow, you could do this and that, and the microtones in between that's smearing it all is what gives it that interesting quality that's natural on one hand, but very not a typical human tendency on the other. <laughs> um, and now I'll show you um, the bass. <laughs>
with my right hand, a lot of people will ask me, what's going on? How are you doing that? Because it's very difficult to um, get a staccato by jerking the hand upwards, and it's very hard on the wrist. So I had this idea to move my volume hand just away from the antenna and use my thumb as a stopping place and also as a way to keep time with it so there's a definite place it's going. But you can also control um, you can control the amount of sustain with your notes. So if you hold it like this and slowly return it to the antenna, you give the illusion that there, there's a little bit of um, a resonance coming off of it. So I'm doing a lot of mimicking of the sounds of things I hear um, that I want to try to accomplish with this um, instrument, because I try to do as much as I can with it. You know, I can't do like piano chords and stuff, so it's like, okay, what can I do that's kind of like string instrument things? And the other limiting thing about it is because it's so much um, like a voice and it's like a one-stringed instrument, like having a violin with one string or a cello with one string. And, um, and so normally when you're watching string players, they can jump over onto the next uh, string without having to move the position of their hand to an octave jump just looks like this. And using their finger jumping to the next string rather than doing this all of the time. And so um, right now I'm working with an engineer from Moog company. Um, I don't know if anyone else will buy this um, <laughs> modification, but I want it. <laughs> and that's uh, to be able to um, move my volume hand either to the left and jump down a fifth or a fourth and when my volume hand goes just to the right without changing my volume level to jump up a fourth or a fifth. And that will change the possibilities of, um, you know, not just repertoire, I do like playing written music going back, you know, hundreds of years, but also um, there are, it'll be a different way of getting around on this that opens up possibilities um, that, that still would not have to mimic um, uh, trying to be like a violin or trying to be like a voice. Uh, there's still, it's not even 100 years old fully yet, and so there's still a lot of possibilities. And on the good side, um, nobody can tell you, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> there's no nothing to compare it to, and no two people will use the exact same hand techniques in the same way with a piano. They're not going to, you know, no one has the same hand structure, not everyone can reach beyond an octave or up to a 13th, you know, just like this. And so um, there are, It'll be exciting to hear what hopefully maybe someone here or our children one day will be doing with this thing if it's sort of this. <laughs> um, do you have other questions? Yes. An equipment list. Yes. So, um, I have on my website a list of um, the pedals that I'm using. If you look at the solo theremin orchestra section, I have like the written list. Um, you're welcome also before leaving, you can take your camera on your cell phone or ask a friend to do that and you can photograph because you can also see then the order that I'm plugging the cables into and I have little alphabet stickers on there um, that kind of give a little hint at um, the order of the placement of my pedals because I'm not really patching them in as I go. It'll be like, ah, ah. And um, this model is no longer um, being produced, but there's a model that is easy to find by the same company called the Etherwave or the Etherwave Pro, uh, no, Etherwave, something Etherwave. Um, it's the small box one. If you have seen it on stage before, it's the size of a shoe box. And there's one also at the Carnegie Public Library and with the theremin zone headphones so that, you know, if you're shy about people hearing you and noodle around on it, um, the important thing is to realize that if people are walking around you while you're testing it, that is going to make the pitch go up. Um, so <coughs> something like that might happen even though you're staying very still and then you know, oh, there's somebody too close to me. And if you keep in mind, just um, there are only four knobs on it. Two of them are for controlling the sound quality, and the other two are for adjusting the volume and the pitch antenna. And so you just have to experiment around a little bit until you find a comfortable place for reaching your notes. Um, and um, yeah, that's what I would recommend, um, trying it out first. 
rent soon if you want to sink your money into getting one. They cost about between three and four hundred dollars, I think. And it's kind of like buying an electric guitar. But if you look on eBay, a lot of people, they sell them, they get sick of them, and you can get it for a cheaper price. And sometimes people think it's broken and um, because this thing can sometimes happen to it. So what was happening there is it looks like it's going in reverse. That it hits this zero point where the note gets really low, but then it's there in the air, and then it's going backwards. And that's only just making an adjustment with your pitch knob. But some people don't realize that. And also, if you're playing this in your bedroom, and there's a bunch of furniture and things around that, um, that have an effect that conduct electricity, um, you'll need to change where you put that pitch knob. You can't just say, I leave it at 3 o'clock, and that's the perfect setting. Because um, if you move the instrument just a few inches, that will drastically change the spaces that you need between your notes. And, um, and that happens often with people when they first bring it on stage. They've been practicing in a practice room somewhere, and then suddenly going on a big stage and there's lots of space, and then this backwards thing might happen, and then they think, it's broken, oh no. And so you might get a really good deal because some people don't know that. <laughs> or you could tell them and say, hey, I gave you a lesson now. <laughs> um, are there other questions? Or yeah? Um, yes, but I think it's also my own laziness. Um, like, let me see if I hit this. No. One day I'll figure that out because I'm so lazy with that part. And the, usually, uh, like one of my bandmates is like the the total like technician, like nerdoid on um, yeah on sound things at the concert. So <laughs> I just kind of turn it over to him, like you should get rid of the buzz, and, or he I don't even have to say it. He's just like oh, and running around and checking. But there there are you know just uh, the equipment I'm working with. Uh, some of it's kind of cruddy and old and. Stomping on the boxes is also really loud, um, and to, but that's kind of like dealing with just how it is, because I, I don't really have a desire to go into the realm of having to move to a laptop, but I also need my feet to control um, when I'm starting and stopping something with a machine. So there's kind of this dilemma of how to simplify my setup and make it more portable, but the pedals keep growing. This is only half of them. <laughs> Um, they do interfere with each other when they're the same make and model and they're both turned on and near each other or plugged into um, the same outlet on a wall or along the same ground or whatever. Um, and the, and the, the irritation between the two of them sometimes is like the effect of a ring modulator, could, which could be kind of jarring if that's not what you want. And also, if the other person touches their volume antenna, it could make your pitch jump on your instrument. And so it's really difficult um, having two of the same model together turned on and playing together um, if you want to have control over it. So you would need a lot of space and to experiment around with um, where to plug things into the wall. Um, if you're trying to play alone, two of them together, um, that's also like a really experimental thing in trying to figure out do I want the volume up all the time, and how do I accomplish controlling the volume? You could also plug it into a volume pedal, the other theremin, so you could control the volume with that there, but you would be standing on one leg. and Or, or you could wait till the next life when we're all octopuses or something, and then, then you could do a bunch more things at the same time. I'd be my own string quartet. I could do this thing. <laughs> um, oh, we have a question back there. Oh, wow, that's a good question. I don't know. Well, actually, all theremin players are blind because you have no visual reference. Um, it's all completely by feel. Um, if you look at how my hand looks when I'm playing a scale, say, or just playing anything. Oh, actually, 
Hey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not using my volume hand with it, but you kind of get a sense of um, treating your own hand like a fingerboard. And so sometimes you do, you really are blind when you're playing this thing because no matter what fixed point in the air that you want to try to reach for, it's not always the same when you're going up and then coming back down because if another part of your body comes closer to it or your elbow moves in the air, this same fixed place will um, have a different pitch. So if I'm like this, it's very, very wibbly wobbly. <laughs> and another weird, like, straining exercise is if you were even to try to hold a still note, and as somebody is approaching slowly towards you, what would you do to try to keep that note from bending upwards and, and figuring out like how much to compensate? And it's like another way of just uh, you're seeing with your ears with this thing and, um, and then adjusting with your body. So you can also use your own body as the equivalent of the pitch tuning knob on this because if I just even step forward more into its field, and then move backwards, I'm going to increase uh, the amount of octaves and decrease the space between the notes. So you can see it's a smaller gesture, and that high note is no, no longer down next to my body being close to here. Um, are there other questions? Ah, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I originally started on piano, and I was always fascinated with, you know, just violin. That was the only string instrument I knew of, watching TV. And it was in junior high. I was in an orchestra class, and that's when I had my first exposure to the string family and jumped, like, devoured the string instrument family. <laughs> and that, so I started with the violin, then got switched to viola because there's always a lack of viola players. And then to the cello um, the next year because somebody graduated and they needed another cellist. And I was like, I'll do it. I want to learn the cello. And then in high school, the, the, I was starting to play contrabass in the orchestra. And then um, the bass player in the jazz band was graduating. And so the teacher asked, like, do you want to play jazz? And so he gave me some records to bring home. And then I just um, studied up um, walking bass lines. <laughs> and and took the bass home. And so I stuck with the bass um, up until the point of encountering the theremin. And so, so and that's why I, a lot of people are like, wow, you do these bass line things, or uh, also in a jazz context. And it's because I'm familiar with making bass lines anyway, so I have that in my head walking. And the great thing about walking on this is you can actually, um, you don't have to make very big jumps to get to the next change. It can be just like a whole step or a third away from you to get to the next change. But just the, you know, walking can be almost kind of like making scales leading to the next harmony that comes or being able to redefine it too. So that was really fun for me to use the theremin in that way. And when people ask, how do you get the bass with the smaller model? Because they don't go down that low. Um, this pedal right here, the Electroharmonics uh, Microsynth, the bass one I recommend, um, because it, you can bring in the sub-octave, get it two octaves lower on the little cheap model, and if you're using a really fat sound system or a bass amp, then you're just making little adjustments to the tone, like the sound quality or sound color, 
of the instrument um, as well as on the amp, and then you're able to have uh, you know a really comfortable playing range for uh, the bass. And for smaller instruments, it's not so comfortable um, to play or attempt the bass or even cello range on those because it gets too washy and wide. But when you use that pedal, then you're all set. And that's what I did before I had the later models. Oh, five more minutes. OK. Yes, OK, I'll just close and like do some like noodling around now. And then I could just leave the loops going. It's like exit music. You know, like the end of that Monty Python movie. <laughs>
Wow, thanks for putting up the weirdness. <laughs> it's like now you have like he's like, ooh, that's a real catchy tune. Like <laughs> you're walking around <laughs> Did you do that? Like <laughs> Thanks for coming out and um yeah, and hopefully see you when I'm back in Pittsburgh again. Thanks. And thanks for bringing me here, making it happen. 